All right, hello, Theater 319. Here we're gonna talk about part uh, three of our Unit 3 lecture, The History of Women's Rights, First Wave Feminism, and how it relates to uh, Sophie Treadwell and Machina. So, <laughs> obviously, this kind of a header at the top of any slide ever is ridiculous because the history of women's rights is far, far more complicated and, and uh, uh, vast than I could even con consider uh, summarizing in one slide, one lecture, one semester. I mean, you could major in this, right? Point is, however, what I'm doing right now is talking about some of the major milestones in women's rights that lead up to the time when Treadwell is writing and thinking about Machina. Okay? So we are in the age of what I would describe as, not me, just lots of historians would describe as first wave feminism, right? That first wave of feminism takes place in the late 19th and early 20th century and seeks first wave feminist seek to fight official discrimination, right? The most common uh, um, goal that you, that you can sort of uh, identify and relate to with first wave feminism is the right to vote, women's rights to vote. The suffrage movement is a huge foundational part of first wave feminism, right? Um, let's talk about some milestones on the development of uh, women's rights. In 1848 in America, the Seneca Falls Convention takes place. It's essentially the first pro-suffrage gathering convention conference um, that happens. Seneca Falls uh, Convention results in um, a whole lot of resolutions that are sent to Congress, basically a list of like, here are the ways we think that the government should treat women. And Congress is basically pats women on the head and says, forget it, because because the patriarchy, right? Um, 1869, the National Woman Suffrage Association is the first formal organization to advocate for, lobby for uh, a women's suffrage. In 1870, a, a big milestone is passed in the United Kingdom. Women can own property after marriage. So this is another reminder to anyone who looks back in the past and says, well, why didn't they just get divorced? Because you get nothing like literally nothing. And even after 1870 in the UK, you can fight for your property, but your husband in the vast majority of situations is gonna say, I earned all this money, I get all the property. And so divorce means instant poverty, right? But at least you have legal right to own property that you used to own after a divorce. 1883 in the UK, women actually are allowed to buy their own property. That's right, for the first time in the United Kingdom, 1883, a woman can own property. That's insanely late when you think about the overall history of Western society. In 1916, Margaret Sanger founds the first birth control clinic in the United States um, in, uh, in downtown New York City. Um, it is almost immediately shut down on charges of obscenity because you don't talk about any of these things when we talk about uh, women you don't talk about anatomy physiology none of that stuff gets talked about in public women essentially are kept from the uh, an understanding of how their own bodies work and sanger's clinic among other things including providing birth control sought to educate women in a way that the patriarchy said was obscene so they shut it down also, side note, Margaret Sanger is, uh, on one hand, a hero for, for providing education and birth control access to women, and is also, like, super racist, believed in the, some ideas of eugenics, of, like, genetic uh, determinism that were really problematic. So, history's a mess, folks. 1919, Congress passes, passes the suffrage amendment guaranteeing all women in the United States the right to vote. Um, now, there were lots of states in America that already allowed women to vote in 1919, um, but the majority of them didn't or didn't allow full suffrage. This ensures that all women everywhere in the United States get the right to vote. And then we get to the 1920s. You're familiar with the Roaring Twenties, Flapper Girls, Jazz Age, relative liberation, right? And it really is a cultural liberation to a big degree, but it's also very relative, right? We're not like destroying the patriarchy, for instance. We're uh, um, making small steps towards personal individual freedom and expression. So just a little bit of a, a snapshot of women's rights leading up to and around the time when uh, Machinal was written. Let's talk about literal feminism, the first wave feminist mindset. People in this era who found themselves to be, uh, or called themselves feminists were not walking around being like, I'm a liberal feminist, how about you? This is an idea or a theory that historians and theorists have looked back on and identified. So when we talk about first wave feminists, we're talking about liberal feminist ideas that women deserve legal equality, not so hard to imagine, right? Employment equality, 
and we're still in a place where women today are not paid the same amount of money for the same job with the same education as a man is. And simply attention in daily life and culture, right? You've heard the phrase, it's a man's world. It remains, even in the 21st century, a man's world, but certainly around the turn of the century, end of the 1800s, early 1900s, right? Women's work is in the home. It's private. It's not talked about, right? Stories aren't told about women unless they are within the view of a man, et cetera, et cetera. So liberal feminist mindset says women deserve legal employment and um, attention equality is how I would put it. Generally, liberal feminism manifests itself in the theater in a bunch of different ways. A traditional realistic style, generally speaking, go back to um, aesthetics or uh, script analysis, whichever it was called when you took it, right? We read trifles in that, in that class. That's a really classic liberal feminist mindset. Again, look at all of the, of the above things. Um, attention in daily life and culture, we got, we got a lot of that stuff up there, right? And trifles is straightforward realism. Generally, liberal feminism in the theater employs a straightforward, realistic style, advocates for works, the inclusion of works by, for, and about women. Not super radical, right? So this is kind of what we're talking about. Liberal feminism is not hugely radical. At the time, it was seen that way. But liberal feminism gives us the development in female playwrights, female main characters, and a whole bunch of other stuff about women sort of... Uh, um, becoming more of a focus when it comes to storytelling. Sophie Treadwell, there she is. Definitely a first wave feminist and just generally kind of an awesome woman slash badass, right? She's educated, college educated. She's a social activist. There she is in that picture that just came up with Pancho Villa, like the Mexican rebel Pancho Villa. This is when she was working as a journalist. She went down into revolutionary uh, uh, war-torn Mexico and found Pancho Villa and interviewed him because she's awesome, right? Um, so she just has these really interesting ideas. And her social activism and journalism background are what took her to Machinal. She wrote a handful of traditional plays before Machinal, um, but this play was drawn from her journalistic background. She and lots of other reporters in America covered the story of the Ruth Snyder and Judd Gray trial and execution. If you've seen the musical Chicago, that musical is based on the play Chicago, which was written in 1924, which is somewhat based on the Ruth Snyder and Judd Gray trial and execution, right? And Machinal is as well. Long story short, Ruth was having an affair with Judd. They conspired together to kill Ruth's husband to get the insurance money. They did it so badly, like there were multiple attempts at poisoning him that didn't work, and then they finally violently succeeded in killing him, and they were arrested, and it was like trial of the century, because, among other things, Ruth had a lead role in the murder. And as you know, especially in the 1920s, but generally, right, society gets really freaked out by women who kill. So there was a lot of attention paid to this case. It was a big scandal as headline maker, etc. Here's what Judd said about Ruth. I warn all men against bad liquor and evil women. If I had not taken a drink, I would not have met the woman who has placed me in the position I am in now. Bad liquor and evil women make a combination too strong for any man. Oh, Judd Gray. I mean, the voice of like patriarchal sexism right there, right? Oh, it was just all Ruth's fault. And I think, I don't think, Sophie Treadwell read this story, covered this story, listened to quotes like these, and essentially said, well, hold on. Nobody's asking about Ruth. We're just condemning her. Like, what's her story? Now, Ruth Snyder is not the same thing as the young woman, but certainly there is inspiration from, right? So my question for you is, among other things, when we think about this women who kill, right? What are the tropes? What are the baggage? What's the stereotype? Think about that one, right? Um, and then, not small group, but this is your discussion, right? How does Machinal investigate the idea of a female murderer in a complex way. The young woman is definitely guilty of murder, spoiler alert, right? But she's also given complexity in some interesting ways. And certainly Treadwell is after doing that to pay attention to women and women's stories, right? What specific scenes, moments, conversations, ideas does our playwright create that cause empathy for the young woman? Because there are quite a few in there. So that's where we are. That's the end of our Unit 3 lectures. Um, go forth and take the quiz and then uh, read the play and we'll uh, hear your comments in the discussion board. Thanks.